Dear Daughter, This may be one of the most awkward letters I have ever written. It is very personal in the sense that it is as a father writing to a daughter. It is also personal in that it is relative and reflective and expressive on many who have come to know you personally. This is the final plea of a father and mother, an eldership, and a congregation for you to please come home. It is not the end of the congregation encouraging you to come home, but it is the last correspondence this eldership will send before we announce before the congregation your deliberate refusal to return. It is difficult to understand why anyone would have to plead so for your return based upon your own words. You've expressed yourself how everyone here at the congregation treated you with genuine courtesy and respect. You also have told us many times how much peace you had by just being with the people here and how you need this interaction with such people. We would assume that you have little doubt as to the concern everyone has for you by the cards and phone calls you received. Even though you did not answer nor return your phone calls, you still must be impressed with the desire of others to talk with you. You've also stated the, hor the horror you have of passing from this life in your present condition. All of these will be forgotten in time as the heart grows more distant and the conscience more callous. On a very personal level, I beg you as a father to return and begin a climb that I realize will be difficult but far, far from impossible. The Lord himself realized it would be a straight and hard way at its best. You also know that a very few people have life at its best. All have their struggles. Some of the best memories of my life are those that include you. We talked together, prayed together, visited and campaigned together, and sometime just played. To me, you will always be daddy's little girl. You know that. The choice is yours. If you choose not to return, your, de your decision will be made known to the congregation. This will change our relationship as well as your relationship with the members at the congregation until you do what you know very well is the right thing to do. Take the time to read Luke 15, 11 through 4, 24. Maybe this will help. We love you. The names have been omitted, but this is an actual letter that you can find in Kyle Butt's book that their souls might be saved. Written to an elder's daughter who had become an erring Christian. Ronnie and I understand that this topic isn't addressed very often, and we as ministers need to do a good job at proclaiming the entire truth of God's Word. And this month, for the next few weeks, Ronnie and I have decided that on Sunday night it would be good for us to discuss the topic of church discipline. I want to begin this series not by raising my voice, being ugly, being blunt, even though this topic touches me personally in my life and in my family. I simply tonight want to show you the facts about what the Bible says concerning church discipline. And I want us to begin in my first point this evening is discuss the problems in the church all over the world that has caused us to ignore this command from God. Because, friends, it is a command from God that we find in the Bible. The problems that we face, I have summed up into two smaller categories. The first being simply a lack of knowledge. We may ask ourselves and ask the congregation this question, what sins are even worthy of church discipline? Are there sins that demand church discipline, demand withdrawal, or are there any sins that can demand withdrawal? I hope you have your Bibles because tonight is the time we need to use it. Open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9 through 13. Paul is talking, writing to the Corinthian brethren on this very subject. A man has his father's wife, and they are allowing him to live in this adulterous relationship and continue in fellowship with the church. And in this conversation with the Corinthians, 
Paul gives a list that they are not to fellowship with those who are called a brother who are a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner. Friends, this passage and also Titus chapter 1 and verse 10, Titus chapter 3, verse 10 and 11 tell us that there are more sins than just adultery that call for church discipline. I want you to look specifically at two passages in Thessalonians. First of all, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 6. The same thing as 1 Corinthians is in the context of church discipline. He says there, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received from us. Paul commands the church in Thessalonica to withdraw from those who walk disorderly. That means not in the proper order, nor marching in line like a soldier would. When soldiers progress, they march in a formation. This word has the idea with it that they are not marching in sync with the other brethren. He says they are to withdraw themselves from those who walk disorderly. And he says there at the last half of that verse, and not after the tradition which he received from us. And he's talking about there the commands of God. The traditions there are the words that he has imparted to the Thessalonians through his epistles, the commands of God. That's easy for us to see if we just read down a few more verses in the context where he says, And if any man not obey our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Not only are those who are fornicators, covetous, idolaters, or railers, or drunkards, those who need to have church discipline, but also those who don't walk according to the commands of God, those who do not listen to the words that God has written in his New Testament. Those are the ones that we are to withdraw from. You go to 1 Thessalonians, and you look at chapter 5 in verse 14. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 14. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly. Comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak. Be patient toward all men. He says, withdraw from the unruly. That means those who are insubordinate. Now who, do you, who is we are Christians? Who are we supposed to be in submission to? We're supposed to be in submission to God, to Christ. And to our eldership. And anyone who would resist the commands of God, who would ignore and speak out and confront and actively protest the commands of the eldership, they are insubordinate. If you go back just a few more verses, same chapter, chapter 5 and verse 12, in reference to the elders, this is what Paul has to say. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord. Who's that referring to? The elders and admonish you. Friends, we are supposed to adhere to the commands of our elders as long as it is in accordance with the commands of God because it is their responsibility, according to this verse, to admonish us. Guess what? That is the same word as in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 6. It's talking about church discipline. They are to oversee the discipline of the church. They are to be responsible for us. And if we openly resist them, then we are in need of discipline. We are in need of correction. And that, that is something we need to understand. It's not necessarily, oh, Nathaniel told a lie. He repented of that lie, but we still need to withdraw from him. That's, that's not what's being discussed here. It's talking about someone who continuously lives in sin. Nathaniel told a lie publicly, and he knows it's a lie. We've told him that he needs to correct that lie, but he will not do it. He refuses to change. That is when church discipline is necessary. Any sin 
that is publicly and continued to be lived in is one that needs church discipline. But let me ask a question, and maybe you've asked this one as well. What's the difference between church discipline and withdrawing of fellowship? Well, that's something we all need to understand. All withdrawal is church discipline. But not all church discipline is withdrawal. I can give a very good example of that here at the Adamsville Church of Christ. If you've ever gone to Monday Night for the Master, you've been asked to make phone calls, make visits, see about your brothers and sisters who have not been attending worship regularly. That is a type of church discipline. Church discipline is oftentimes looked at by us, especially in America, as an ugly word. Discipline? That's not, that's not something we need to do here. Discipline is bad, but discipline isn't maybe what you think it is. Church discipline is simply holding each other accountable. If I'm not here on Sunday, Brother Don makes a phone call and says, Nathaniel, you okay? I didn't see you Sunday. Everything all right? Do you need encouragement? That is a type of of church discipline. Withdrawal from someone who is walking disorderly is the last and final step in a progression of church discipline. And we need to understand that, especially at a strong congregation such as Adamsville, who is such a beacon of light to those around us, we need to understand the truth on church discipline and what it means to hold each other accountable. And we see verses that talk about holding each other accountable all the time. You know, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25. We're commanded to hold each other accountable. But when we call it church discipline, that's when we get a little scared. And maybe that's because we do not understand what it really is. It's simply holding each other accountable. It is a process that God has written in His Word for us to help each other stay on the proper path. Another thing that we might uh, misunderstand and one problem that we might come in contact with that makes it hard to practice church discipline is sometimes we lack discipline ourselves. We, We do not discipline as we should, and we, again, think of that word as a scary word. But friends, the psalmist, the writer of Proverbs, and the author of Hebrews all tell us that discipline should not be something that we're afraid of. I hope you'll turn to Psalm 119 and look with me at what the psalmist says there. Psalm 119, I want us to read verse 67 and 71. Psalm 119, verses 67 and 71. Here the psalmist writes in verse 67, Before I was afflicted, what's that word? Disciplined. I went astray, but now I have kept thy word. The psalmist says, I went astray, but because of discipline from God, I have learned to keep his commandments. Verse 71, it is good. Notice that word, good, for me that I have been afflicted that I might learn thy statutes. We need to adopt the psalmist's view of church discipline. We should view it in the sense that it's supposed to be done with love and that God loves us and he wants us to do what's right. And that when we look at church discipline, when we look at correction, we need to look at the end result, which is the fact that we will follow the word of God. The Proverbs as I mentioned before, also talk about this. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 11 and 12. Proverbs 3, 11 and 12. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be wary of his correction, for whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father the son in whom he delighteth. Correction is done out of love. Is that not what we read in Thessalonians? The correction of the church is done for the same reason. It is out of love. And that concept of correction being in the 
form of a father and a son can even be seen in the New Testament. I want you to turn over to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, the Hebrews writer expounds on this concept of correction as a father would a son. And this is what the Hebrews writer says, If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with a son. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be without ch chastisement, whereof are all partakers? Then are ye illegitimate, sons without fathers, and not sons of God. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. I revere my father now that I'm adult because he corrected me. He taught me the proper path. And we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit. He's basically saying there, a parent disciplines their child to the best of their knowledge, to the best of their ab ability. And that may not always be the best way. But God knows the best way. He is infinite in knowledge. And the way that he disciplines us he knows is the best way to do it, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now, ch chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, seemeth not to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. That is the verse that we need to keep in mind. It may seem horrible, it may seem painful for a time, but we need to keep the end in mind. It is for righteousness unto them who listen and follow when they are corrected, exercised thereby. I think if we look at these passages and we understand that those are the things we typically have questions about, typically what we worry about, if we just open our Bibles and read these passages, I believe that that will give us some understanding, some knowledge, and also teach us that discipline should not be something to be afraid of, but something to be encouraged. Now, I'm trying to deal with the facts of the Bible. And so I want to take time in my second point to talk about the precepts of the Word of God concerning church discipline. And what I mean by precepts, I use that word to keep it alliterated, but commands. What are the commands of God? Well, perhaps if you've studied, and maybe some of you who have uh, been here since Bob Duncan and Franklin Camp, you've heard this statement made. The Bible teaches us through direct command, example, and divine inference. And that's basically what I want us to see here in the scriptures concerning church discipline. There are examples, there are commands, and there are procedures that we can find in the Bible concerning this topic. It's not made up. It's not something that uh, it was created by the Catholic Church or something like that. But this is what we find in the New Testament. Look at some examples. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 20. Paul talks about Hymenaeus and how he was going to correct Hymenaeus because he was walking disorderly. And church discipline is not even beyond apostleship. You turn over to Galatians chapter 2 and verse 11. This is the one I want us to actually look at. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 11. This is what Paul says. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. Paul understood correction and that if we, no matter who we are, are walking disorderly, we are to be disciplined. And that's another example of an apostle, Peter, being disciplined. We can find examples of God purging his people of those who live sinful lives, even in the Old Testament. You look at Genesis 17, verse 14, Leviticus chapter 7, verse 27, chapter 17, verse 18 and 19, Deuteronomy 13, 12 through 18, Deuteronomy 17, 2 through 5. And I say all these not to look them up, but to show you that there is ample evidence of discipline in God's people in the Old and in the New Testament. 
But even if those examples aren't enough, there are express commands for church discipline. I want you to go back to Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 14. We read this passage already, but I want you to notice a different thing in this passage. He says there, Now exhort your brethren, warn them that are unruly. There are express, explicit statements like that. Warn them. Is that a question or is that a command? That's a command, friends. Warn them who are unruly. You go over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, and we looked at verse 6, but also verse 10. Verse 6, he says, now we command you. Verse 10, he says, for even when we were with you, this we commanded you. It's a command to practice church discipline. Uh, Brother Kyle Butt in his, in his book made a very powerful statement that scared me a little bit. He said, you know, we are to obey God's commandments. And if we think we're going to heaven when we don't keep everything he's commanded us to do, we can be fooling ourselves. And that, that's scary because sometimes we do overlook commands in His Word. But that's why we need to study, why we need to look, why we need to search to be sure that we are keeping all of His commandments. Not only that, Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1. I like this word here in Galatians chapter 6 verse 1. Another one of those explicit statements. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. He commands them to restore. Restore. Don't let them sit by and rot away in sin, but restore them back to the truth. And that is directed specifically to ye which are spiritual. Who's that? That's everyone who wears the name Christian. That is our responsibility, our command. James chapter 5 and verse 19, we won't read that one, but he uses that word convert. That literally means revert. Cause your brother to come back to the truth. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 3 through 5, he says explicitly, withdraw thyself from those who are not doing what's right. And then I want us to look at this passage. Titus chapter 2 and verse 15. Titus chapter 2 and verse 15. I believe this is a very powerful statement from Paul. He says here, These things speak and exhort and rebuke. With how much authority? Some authority, no authority. He says, all authority. It is a command to practice church discipline. And then finally, the procedures. And I don't want to cover this in much detail, but I want to point them out to you, and then we'll, we'll deal with them in more detail next week. There's a procedure set out for us in how to practice church discipline. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 19 through 20. Don't take one's, one person's word for it. Rebuke them in the presence of the whole congregation. 2 Thessalonians 3, 14 and 15. Note that person and do not keep come with, company with them, but admonish him as a brother. Romans 16, 17. Mark. That means to regard, consider, make known who is this person living in sin. And there that word is again, avoid that person. Do not keep company with them. In Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 17, go to him in private, then with two or more, then to the congregation. That is the procedure for church discipline that God has laid out. We ought not to skip any of those steps, but we should follow through with each of them. And then finally, my last point, and this completely takes place in... 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and that is the pattern. There is a pattern that we see in 1st and 2nd Corinthians of church discipline. 
And Paul and the church at Corinth both practice church discipline on this brother who had his father's wife. And we can see how painful it is, but we also see the process and the command. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 through 2, Paul identifies the sinning brother. That person needs to be identified. It doesn't need to be kept secret, but if it's something that's public, something that that person is engaging in that is part of their lifestyle, that needs to be pointed out and viewed so that the correct discipline can be administrated. Secondly, rebuke. Paul didn't just identify this person and withdraw from him, but instead in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 2 through 3, he corrects the congregation as a whole. Why? Because they boasted that they were so tolerant of his sin. Isn't that the way we, we act all the time? I'm so loving because of this person. I know that they're, what they're doing is wrong, but I accept them anyways. Paul says that's not the way it needs to be done. If you truly love them, you will try to help them change. You will try to help them be corrected. It's just like a man going to a doctor, and he says, I, I have a hard time breathing. And the doctor gives a CAT scan and an X-ray, and he finds out that that man has terminal cancer, terminal lung cancer. And that doctor, because he knows it's going to upset his patient, because it's going to stress him out, it's going to ruin his day, he says, I'm not going to tell him about the cancer he has in his lungs. Is that the way we need to be? We should help that person because they have something worse than physical cancer. They have spiritual sin. And if we truly love them, we'll follow after the pattern that Paul lays out here in 1 Corinthians. You also see that after his rebuke, they did obey him. He says there, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6, they are actually go back to chapter 2, verse 3. They did obey his commands. And in chapter 2, verse 6, we see the repentance of that man. He had church discipline and acted on him. They withdrew their fellowship from him. And guess what? He came back to the church. And after that, the last thing there under pattern is restoration. He was restored, chapter 2, verse 7 and 8. There is God's complete pattern for church discipline laid out to us in the books of First and Second Corinthians. And I know we didn't get to go in as much detail with all of that as I wish we could have, but for time's sake we didn't. But I want you to read that, to study that, and hopefully, Lord willing, when we assemble again, we'll be able to go into more detail as to this. But I want to lay out the facts for you about church discipline. Why? Because of James chapter 2 and verse 10. Look with me there. James chapter 2 and verse 10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law yet offendeth in one point, he is guilty of all. If I do everything else right according to God's word, but I do not practice church discipline, it's as if I didn't do anything. God wants us to keep his whole law. 1 John chapter 3, verse 18 tells us that we are to love our Christian family more than just in word, but in deed also. Finally, I want to close out with this passage. Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 8 and 9. The Lord knows what's best. He knows what He's doing. He didn't put this command in here because it might work or it might not. It might be the best way to do it. It might not. He put it in there because He knew that this was the most effective way to help and erring brethren. Friends, I love all of you, and I care about all of you, and this is something that we all need to study, all need to pray about, all need to think about, because it is something that the Lord has commanded us to do, and we need to fulfill His commands. We love you so much, and we appreciate you, and if you're here this evening and there's something in your life that 
has caused you to fall away from God, a sin that you have committed, and you are living in that sin, and tonight you want to make it right. You want to repent of that sin. You want to come back to the Lord and be forgiven. Don't wait. Do that tonight. Don't leave without doing it. But come forward and make it known if it's public. Or if you haven't ever obeyed the gospel, I hope that you will do so tonight. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, please come forward as we stand and as we sing.